on this Wednesday night. I'm going to have to live with this for the rest of my life. The latest in our investigation into the medical devices we put in our bodies. What happens when an implant that wasn't meant to come out needs to come out? Coca-Cola sells sugar-flavored water for more. We are essentially giving our oil away for free. Alberta's premier takes her fight to Ottawa, while back at home, her biggest political rival stakes out a position of his own. I think it's a great moment in the history of uh, human spaceflight. And just days from liftoff, Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques tells Chris Brown why he's so optimistic, why so many Russian space workers are not. This is the night. We've been telling you this week about harmful medical devices and implants. In our joint investigation with Radio Canada and the Toronto Star, tonight, what can happen when they need to come out? As Vicodopia tells us, it can be costly, complex, and devastating on the body. A story partly told in images you'll see that show just how serious the consequences can be. Like a trio of dancers, these machines grind away at artificial knees, testing for defects at this center dedicated to artificial joint research. So this is an implant that slowly wore away the plastic. Of all the hip and knee replacements Dr. Thomas Turgeon does, one in six are either removals or repairs called revision surgery. So this is a, a knee replacement problem. Only occasionally is it due to infection or some kind of premature failure. With an aging population, he expects re-replacements will be routine. They have a limited life expectancy, so some of them will go on to fail, and as we're doing more and more of them, we'll expect that number to climb. Artificial hips are among the most common removals, along with pacemakers, cochlear implants, breast implants, and pelvic mesh. Our research has found more than 7,800 patients have had an implant revision or removal in the last 10 years. But some implants were never supposed to come out. Your gynecologist tells me that there's nothing she can do for me. I'm going to have to live with this for the rest of my life. Natasha Roach had a pelvic mesh put in last year to treat urinary incontinence. The symptoms began almost immediately. The constant pain and the pulling, pinching, it, it's like glass, it feels like glass that, that constantly gnaws at your personal area. And she's convinced the device has caused severe infections. But removing mesh can be a complex subspecialty if the mesh is deeply embedded. The same goes for the contraceptive coils called Escher. Often the only expertise is in the U.S., and Roach can't get a Canadian doctor to sign off on getting her treated there. We frequently get told it's in her head. Um, you frequently get told you're making up stories. It's unknown how many Canadian women are paying out of pocket for procedures in the U.S. This surgeon in St. Louis developed special surgical tools for mesh removal. He's operated on more than 20 Canadians. What makes it difficult, quite honestly, is the fact that it wraps around bony structures. It's a boomerang effect with, with the mesh. It wraps around the descending pubic ramus. It wraps around ligaments deep in the pelvis. And that makes it very, very challenging. And this is why mangled mesh embedded in human scar tissue. Thank you. And the price of removal is also challenging for Natasha Roach. We have nothing left financially for me to pay for the surgery. And Vic joins us now. That's a pretty crushing sentence, nothing left to pay for surgery. What sort of help is actually available, though, for people who can only get this in the U.S.? Well, provinces do have financial assistance programs in place, but it's not automatic, even with a doctor signing off on it. We checked with a few provinces for just mesh, and since 2011, Ontario received 21 applications for removals and denied five. Alberta received just three and denied one, and BC received four and denied two. And the reason for those low numbers is that a lot of women can't wait for the process and just pay out of pocket to get it done, sometimes remortgaging, 
limiting or maxing out credit lines. Uh, for example, we spoke to a woman in Grand Falls, Windsor, Newfoundland, who did just that. She didn't have mesh, but rather a pair of those contraceptive coils, Escher, and they were embedded in her fallopian tubes. In September, she went to Texas and had them removed, and she spent $18,000, all her money. Her life savings is now gone. Wow. So, okay, so they're expensive. These are complicated surgeries, as you said. What are the outcomes like? Well, they are complicated, and even after paying all that money, there are no guarantees. For Mesh and Escher, sometimes the surgery is complicated further because of earlier attempts to remove those devices, and that can break them up or push them farther in. For example, when that woman from Newfoundland woke up from her removal surgery in September, she learned that the surgeon also had to take out her fallopian tubes, cervix, and uterus, along with those Escher coils, because they'd gone through the walls of her uterus. So it's a devastating price to pay. Wow. Okay, Vic, thanks very much. Uh, really important work. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, because there's no official way for Canadians to search for information on medical devices, CBC News has created a database using data obtained from Health Canada so you can now look up specific information that's relevant to you. Since it launched on Sunday, there have been more than 25,000 different searches. You can check it out for yourself online. Just go to cbcnews.ca slash medical devices. Okay, turning now to a very different kind of health story about the trauma caused by so-called hazing rituals in Canadian schools and sports. You might have caught our emotional interview we featured last night with former NHLer Daniel Carcillo. Well, today he posted this on Twitter, thanking CBC and the National for support in helping to raise awareness for this human issue, adding, after today, I'll be taking a break from speaking about this to seek out treatment for my trauma. I clearly have a lot of work to do. And as Carcillo takes some time for himself, others are now speaking out about their experiences with abuse in junior hockey. Joanna Romiliotis heard one of them. Daniel Carcillo says putting his story out there brings relief and now the need to retreat. It's been a struggle. Hockey culture needs to change. That's why I speak honestly about what I've been through. Vivid memories. Carcillo's interview with the CBC following his allegations on Twitter about the abuse he witnessed and endured as a rookie player in Ontario has triggered a flood of support from fans to former players and more disclosures. It just ruined me emotionally. Charles Amodio and Carcillo were rookie teammates with the Sarnia Sting. Amodio says he was picked on for his small size, locked in the trunk of a car, stuffed in a bus bathroom with other players, belittled daily by veterans and coaches. They're calling you every name in the book, um, just really degrading who you are. And there was no justification behind it. It was a power trip. And if you said something, if you opened your mouth, if you complained, um, you're pretty much on, 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 on the next bus ride home. Amodio says the apparent complicity made him shut down even more. He and other players say the head coach at the time, Jeff Perry, was aware of the abuse. Perry didn't respond to our questions about that, only applauding Carcillo in a text message for speaking out. The Ontario Hockey League didn't go there either. In a statement, the OHL focused instead on positive changes it has made in recent years including a mental health program called Talk Today that struggling players can turn to. Former NHLer and abuse survivor Sheldon Kennedy is all about awareness and education. My case, it was, it was about the truth, and I think in Daniel's case, it's about the truth. Kennedy is involved with an online certification program that is mandatory for all new coaches in Canada. Eliminating abuse framed as hazing is a priority. To let them know that this is not part of the game, this is not part of uh, how you're going to make our team, and it's un not acceptable. Eric Wellwood is a coach in the OHL, and he says a lot has changed. It's why he has mixed feelings about Carcillo's disclosure. The OHL and the CHL deserve credit and, and not, not to be smeared uh, with a story that, not that it's not true, but that, is, that happened a long time ago, and... and uh, I think there needs to be an understanding that things have changed uh, greatly. For Carcillo, looking back is the only way to move forward. And that, he admits, is a struggle too. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto.
Now, as you heard, OHL coach Eric Wellwood says his league has made a lot of positive changes on this front and that hazing is all but gone from Ontario junior hockey. But what does that mean? Well, in an official statement, the OHL says it's had a zero tolerance policy on hazing for several years now, and any teams caught hazing can be hit with fines and penalties. Players get training on preventing bullying, which they must acknowledge in writing, and the league says it encourages anyone to come forward with concerns about abusive behavior. This country's auto industry has been in focus this week after GM's decision to close an Ontario plant. But today, Alberta Premier Rachel Notley came to Ottawa with a suggestion for federal officials start treating the situation in Canada's oil sector like the crisis it is. The oil we produce in Canada was back around $10. Why? Because we can't get it together to find a way to get it to the market. And that is precisely why pressure is mounting on both the federal and Alberta governments to take action to help boost the price of the province's oil. We'll get to some of the specific plans for that in a moment. But first, it's worth explaining some of the oil patch issues beyond pipelines. So we asked our senior business correspondent, Peter Armstrong, to do just that. We all know that no new pipelines means it's harder to get Alberta's oil to market. But what else is going on? One thing is Canadian oil companies are producing too much. In a lot of ways, the oil patch is haunted by decisions made when oil was at $100 a barrel and pipelines like Energy East and Northern Gateway and Keystone XL still seemed likely. Most of the producers that, that started putting shovels in the ground half a decade ago were expecting that at least one of those pipelines would be in operation today and we wouldn't be in this situation. As it is, there's just too much oil stuck in Alberta and no way to get it to market. The glut grows, the price falls. Canada's heavy crude oil has always been cheaper. Its so-called discount usually around $13 a barrel. So if WTI sells for $50, Canada's bitumen should bring in around $37. But today, WTI sold at $50.35, Canada's benchmark all the way down to $18. That means for every barrel produced, Alberta and Canada bleed money. These discounts are costing Alberta between 15 and $39 billion in lost industry revenue next year. All while as many as 100,000 people have lost their jobs since the price of oil first began to fall in 2014. Canada's not alone in this predicament. The Saudis, the Russians and the Americans are all producing record amounts of oil. And that has forced global oil prices down by more than a third since October. Virtually all the major oil producers are, are, are pumping at all-time highs. So there's just too much oil sloshing around the world. The solution's pretty straightforward. You can either cut oil production or find a new way to get Canadian oil to market. Until you change one of those, Alberta's problems are only going to get worse. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. So how might it get better? Alberta's Premier says she has an answer and she wants the federal government to chip in. Salima Shivji has more on the political push to pump some aid into the oil sands. At a speech in the shadow of Parliament, Alberta's Premier brought a message to Ottawa about a full-blown crisis in the oil industry. So my friends, the toll on jobs is mounting. Anxiety around kitchen tables is rising. That anxiety took over the streets last week as the Prime Minister visited Calgary. And again yesterday when the finance minister was there. A call for action echoed by the premier. Rachel Notley is waiting on help from the feds. So the reality is the federal government should be at the table on this. And in my view, there is very little excuse for their absence. She says she can't hold out any longer. And so Alberta will go it alone. Buying hundreds of rail cars to transport 120,000 more barrels of crude a day to get the oil to market. And she still wants the federal government to pitch in. Because we don't see an end to this in the medium term at this point. And this is something that is within the federal government's area of responsibility. And so we need them to pay more attention. Today, the federal transport minister had little to say about his government's intentions. Um, we're looking at it. But back home in Alberta, a different idea from the leader hoping to replace Notley as premier next spring, one seemingly out of character for a conservative who supports a free market. I am calling on the government of Alberta to act immediately to introduce mandatory curtailment of 10% of Alberta's oil production. 
He says it's the only way to tighten supply and force the price of oil up. But for the oil industry, neither of those solutions is ideal long term. These price differentials are largely the result of what we would consider to be market failures. Failures for effectively government to get the pipelines built in time so that we can get our product to market. That's also top of the wish list for many in Alberta, for Ottawa to get its pipeline plans back on track. The problem is they say there's a need for a short-term fix too, immediate relief for a struggling sector. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. And in the Prime Minister's office today, a rare meeting between Justin Trudeau and the main federal party leaders. But the issue that brought them together, not the oil industry, not even the auto sector, but as the CBC's Catherine Cullen tells us, they discussed issues facing French-speaking Canadians. This is either a shining moment of putting partisanship aside or pure politics. The plan to discuss Doug Ford's cuts to programs for Franco-Ontarians, a provincial issue that's led to federal finger pointing. This morning it seemed like that was going to change. We had a harsh time in the partisanship debate in the last two weeks. We all recognized that, uh, but now it's time to move on. I'm looking forward to meeting with uh, all the different party leaders uh, to talk about how uh, we need to, at the federal level, be uh, united and above partisanship. But by mid-afternoon, the whiff of partisanship was back when the Prime Minister brought this up in the middle of an English answer about the carbon tax. Ça fait 14 jours que le gouvernement conservateur en Ontario a, a, coupé, a sabré dans les services aux francophones. Ça fait 14 jours que le chef de l'opposition ne me pose pas une question euh, sur cet enjeu important. So what did the meeting itself accomplish? That's a useful symbolic statement to governments that might not think that there is support right around the political spectrum. Though it seems Ford was not won over by the symbolism. Stop your talking and start doing something. All they do up there is talk. And they couldn't agree on the right way to revive plans for a francophone university. I think we need to actually propose something concrete to put more pressure on the provincial government. The Conservatives in Ontario need to uh, step up and make sure that they make uh, the demand to the federal government. And she wrapped up the non-partisan meeting with a swipe saying Andrew Scheer wasn't doing enough to pressure Ford to protect francophones. Now whether Mr. Scheer will go and say it as clearly as uh, we would like him to do, it's up to him to actually answer that question. So much for unity. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National. Families affected by the Humboldt Broncos bus crash get the final word on their share of that massive GoFundMe campaign. We'd give any amount of money to have our son back, no question. And I think I can speak for every family is, is happy that it's completed. A judge today ruled families of the 16 who died will get $475,000 each. Those injured and their families will get a little less, $425K each. The full $15 million should be distributed by Christmas. She will be remembered as a woman who is so strong and positive and loving and generous and respectful. Family and friends paid tribute today to French teacher Valérie Théoré. She and her 10-month-old daughter were killed in a bear attack. It happened Monday near their remote trapping cabin in Yukon. Valérie's husband is the one who found their bodies. The territory's Francophone Association is hosting a support event tomorrow. Ahead tonight on the National, in just days now, a Canadian astronaut will blast off in a Russian rocket. We'll go in-depth with David Saint-Jacques and look at what's really at stake. Plus, why families are flocking to a library on the Canada-US border. Their reunions, our moment of the day. But first, the championship watched around the world today, the high drama at the World Chess Championship. It's very exciting. You can cut the tension with the knife. <laughs> I very much can, uh, can feel their pain and excitement. Well, as sporting events go, it's been more of a marathon than a sprint. Three weeks of grueling play, steely concentration and brinksmanship, all of it conducted in near silence. No cheerleaders, no mascots, 
but plenty of people on the edges of their seats. Chess fans at long last have crowned this year's world champion. And lucky guy Thomas Dagle was at today's rapid fire event. How's this for a champion's welcome? The world's gaze, if only for a day, turned to the fast paced final of a famously slow game. It's very exciting. You can cut the tension with the knife. <laughs> On one side of the board, Magnus Carlsen, the Norwegian grandmaster and reigning champion, a player so famous he appeared on The Simpsons. He merely needs to take grandpa's knife. His opponent, Fabiano Caruana, America's best shot at the world title in four decades. His parents say he started winning at age 17 and he just hasn't stopped. Maybe Fabiano's is uh, destiny is to inspire chess in America. Today, though, would be his biggest test yet. A tiebreaker round after three weeks of play and only draws. There's never been a stalemate quite like this. It's the first time the world's top two players go 12 games in the final without either player winning a single game. That's why this moment is so intense and covered just as keenly as any world championship. The players so evenly matched because of technology and their practice against a computer. Both have access to the same super strong computers to prepare their games and to play their openings. The players' every facial expression and every move scrutinized by a global audience watching online. I very much can uh, can feel their pain and excitement and, and, and being in such a tension. In the end today, Carlson successfully defended his crown, winning the first three quick-fire tiebreakers. I felt like I had a really good day at work today and... Uh... <laughs> That's a thrilling day in the game of chess. Briefly, the world's most exciting sport. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. It really is exciting. I, I think so, anyway. Now, uh, just to give you a taste of how unpredictable chess can sometimes be, consider how the tournament started. So, the same way you've got a ceremonial first pitch in baseball, this championship had its own celebrity appearance. It was just a bit awkward. So actor Woody Harrelson of all people, he botched the ceremonial opening move twice, first knocking over Caruana's king, which is usually what you do when you want to forfeit the game, then he played the wrong pawn. So it turns out he's an actor and a comedian. But uh, for the record, Adrian, they did let Caruana take those moves back. Okay, so Woody Harrelson's a funny guy, not all the jokes land, <laughs> and it is a bit of a tough crowd. Anyway, ahead tonight on The National, his story and his fierce fight to better the world inspired people around the world. Tonight, they are paying tribute and remembering a rebel. First, though, as Canadian astronaut David St. Jacques prepares to board a Russian rocket to space, we take an in-depth look at that country's troubled space program. There are risks at every launch, so therefore, yeah, of course we have butterflies, as we say, but what's the solution to that? Just to train more. In just a few days now, Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques will join a very elite club, blasting off from Russia's Baikonur Cosmodrome. He'll visit the International Space Station, something only 232 people have ever done before. Saint-Jacques is eager for his first trip to space, of course, even though a series of high-profile failures has shaken confidence in Russia's once glorious space program. In tonight's Dispatch from Moscow, Chris Brown explores Russia's desperate drive to keep its edge. The flight of David St. Jacques' life is almost at hand. Just final checks of his Soyuz capsule and his equipment are all that's left. Two years of rigorous training has prepared him well for his first trip into space, but it's still hard not to be nervous especially after what happened to the last Soyuz crew. There are risks at every launch, so therefore, yeah, of course we have butterflies, as we say, but what's the solution to that? Just to train more. In October, the last Soyuz mission ended after less than two minutes when the booster rockets failed to separate properly. Turns out, the problem was a sensor. A small piece of metal was damaged by workers when the rocket was assembled. 
The American and Russian on board landed safely, not far from the launch site. But it was a crushing setback for Russia's already beleaguered space program. Thankfully, the engineers around the world have been working very hard to make sure that the, we fit good to the bottom of uh, the investigation of what happened in the previous launch. We're very confident now uh, that uh, we, we know what happened and uh, we've you know, found ways to make sure it did not happen again. Russians are very proud of their successes in space. Saint-Jacques and his wife Veronique acknowledged that with a visit to Yuri Gagarin's grave in Red Square. The first man to orbit the Earth is one of Russia's greatest heroes. But of late, Russia's space failures have dominated the headlines, particularly its cargo-carrying rockets. This 2013 crash of a Proton-M was caused by guidance instruments that workers installed upside down. Then there's the mysterious hole discovered in the Russian orbiter on the International Space Station recently. Russian officials first seem to suggest sabotage, but it's clear the hole was drilled on Earth and then someone tried to cover up their mistake. The worry is Russia's long-running production and mechanical troubles may finally be affecting spacecraft that carry people. I'm afraid currently we are not a reliable uh, partner for uh, the United States uh, and for Europeans. Pavel Luzin wrote his PhD thesis on Russian space policy and he studied the industry intensely. I see decline. Uh, I see uh, the long-term crisis the, uh, that is uh, based on our inability to adapt our economics, uh, adapt our uh, scientific policy for a uh, contemporary world. We met Luzin in the central Russian city of Perm, where he teaches at the local university. The city still looks a lot like it did in Soviet days when it was off limits because of the rockets that were made for civilian and military use. The industry still employs more than 7,000 people here today. Luzin says protecting those jobs by limiting would-be competitors is the priority for Russia's space agency and the Putin government. Russia's space industry is still works like a Soviet space industry and doesn't able to work in market environment. It is able to work only uh, in environment where government uh, is the only consumer and uh, when government pays uh, a lot of money uh, for maintaining of all these manufacturing facilities, uh, for maintaining uh, of all these people. For the next year at least, the U.S. space program needs Russia. Its Soyuz rockets are the only way up to the International Space Station. And NASA pays Russia handsomely for the ride, $80 million a seat. But the plan is to shift the jobs to private companies, such as SpaceX, which have been testing cheaper, reusable rockets. And that will leave Russia's space agency Roscosmos without its biggest source of private revenue. Everyone wants to be like SpaceX. Russia is trying to meet that challenge here. This is Skolkova. It's a high-tech park that opened seven years ago and looks a lot like what you'd see in Silicon Valley, with young IT workers zipping around on scooters and playing ping pong on their brakes. There are 50 space-related startups here in a so-called space cluster, including Sputniks. It's a company that makes small satellites. It is two in orbit now which staff members monitor from these computers. So if you really want to... Ivan Koznikov's job is to work with Roscosmos to get funding for Russia's space entrepreneurs. And at times he says it feels like one of the toughest jobs on Earth. A big part of people, of technical people inside of Roscosmos, they have a mindset of uh, back, in, back in Apollo days. There is a, always a rule, if something works, you know, don't touch it. And you know, you have... Uh, uh, the systems and uh, the components that were running for 50 years already, okay, they're performing good, don't touch it. Roscosmos does have big plans. We saw some of them at a recent trade show. There is a new heavy lift rocket in development called Angara. A new crew capsule that could eventually orbit the moon called Federation. Plus it's building a new launch facility in Vostochny in Russia's far east. But in 10 years, Angara has only launched twice, and it's uncertain when Federation will be ready. 
Delays and production troubles have pushed Khrunichev, Russia's largest rocket manufacturer, to the brink of bankruptcy. Without a change in attitude and mandate, Koznikov worries Russia's Roscosmos will keep falling behind. They have to, well, have to, have to deliver the product to the state, first of all. And uh, all, the, all the other tasks are secondary. And, well, sometimes I think there is not enough money to both uh, compl comply with, uh, to meet the requirements of uh, state program and to support the private space initiative. You've been in here before, have you? Hey. Many times? Yes. Uh, many times and uh, approximately six months. Six months, <laughs> yeah. yes, a long time. Yes. Yelena Kondakova has a special place in Russian society. She is one of only four women cosmonauts. She's a hero of Russia. At Moscow's Space Museum, she showed us around a mock-up of the old Mir space station, where she spent six months in orbit in 1995. Tea, bread, juice, bread. Was it good? Tasty? <laughs> I don't like the bread. <laughs> Now retired, she believes the fact that American and Russian astronauts survived the most recent Soyuz incident is a positive development, as it shows proven Russian technology can still be trusted. То, что наша техника не подводит, и последние вот события, когда у нас сработала система катапультирования, система аварийного спасения, только лишний раз подтвердила о надежности нашей техники. Вот это меня удивляет, что столько лет и мы все еще хорошо работаем. Exploring space, she says, is too expensive for any single country to take on alone, which ensures Russia will continue to have a big role to play. Больше финансирования было, больше, наверное, еще больше сотрудничества у нас в космосе, потому что те программы, которые и американская сторона, европейская и российская заявляют на будущее, те же самые полеты на Луну, полеты на Марс. Они могут пройти только в кооперации со всеми странами вместе. We met up with Canada's David Saint Jacques on a sunny day in Moscow before the Soyuz mishap. Then, as now, he expressed confidence in Russia's reliability as a partner. I think it's a great moment in the history of uh, human spaceflight because there's so many new avenues opening. There are so many other ways to go to orbit that are coming up and people are now shifting their, uh, their gaze to going back to the moon and then eventually to Mars. And with all these players, I think we have a really bright future. Right now, all of Russia's space energies are focused on ensuring Saint-Jacques and his fellow Russian and American crew members on that December flight get up to the International Space Station safely. Neither he nor Russia's Roscosmos have any room for error. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. And with just a few days to go before the big mission launch date, there have been more developments since Chris spoke with David Saint-Jacques, and not good ones. Russian prosecutors believe something is rotten at Roscosmos. That's the big space company Chris visited in Moscow. They have announced criminal prosecutions against 16 people over embezzlement and fraud. And officials say they've uncovered at least 1,700 violations from 2017 to mid-2018. Russia's chairman of the accounts chamber, that's their equivalent of the auditor general, says hundreds of millions of dollars have been siphoned out of the company. But so far, none of this seems to be threatening the mission. And up next on The National, as Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin prepare to meet this weekend, we'll get some perspective on their relationship from a man who knows Putin well, a man who believes the Russian president tried to kill him. But first, people around the world are remembering a man like few others, a fiery phenomenon, a champion for refugees with a huge global following. Harry Leslie Smith died overnight in a hospital in Ontario. He was 95. The hands of a father and son here, one dearly hanging on to the other. But in the middle of the night, that grasp was no more. For the last week of Harry Leslie Smith's life, his son John was gently and diligently updating the world on his dad's decline, as Harry had asked. His quarter of a million followers practically bathed him in cyber support. Get well soon, Harry, from Windsor, Ontario.
Flowers, candy, tea, all dropped off at the hospital doors by strangers. He knew it, and he loved it. The amount of affection and concern was, was just beautiful. It was, it was just really humbling in so many ways. And it was earned. I think there are many things that we can do to better life for as many citizens as is humanly possible. Both Canadian and British citizen, a man who once knew the sort of hunger that saw him as a kid scavenge in the garbage for food. He went on to fight in the Second World War, then rage against poverty and fascism. In the stairs of the modern world's refugees, he recognized the need he saw in those fleeing war long ago. I can still Today in the British Parliament, where there's no such thing as cross-aisle consensus these days, agreement. We thank Harry for his life and his work. The whole House will wish to pass our condolences as well to the family and friends of Harry Leslie Smith. The UN High Commission for Refugees says some have started a campaign to raise funds in his name, and the money's coming in. He'd have liked that, and maybe this too. One of the last tweets sent to him before he died. Rest easy, old soldier. We'll take it from here. Harry Leslie Smith would want the world held to that promise. Well, that ought to sound familiar. Hopefully you got one of those. The latest test of the emergency alert system across the country this afternoon. You might recall last time they tried this, it didn't work everywhere, especially in Quebec. But today the company says it was a success, though there were still some folks who said they did not get the message. Also tonight, the Prime Minister is en route to Argentina to meet with world leaders at the G20. But we'll be keeping a particularly close eye on the sidelines of the summit this Friday. That's when Canada, Mexico and the U.S. intend on signing the new USMCA trade agreement, the new NAFTA. Much of the rest of the world, though, will likely keep an eye on Russian President Vladimir Putin. He's facing international criticism for increasingly aggressive actions, both at home and abroad. So. Nella Ayed caught up with one of his most prominent opponents, a man who knows firsthand what it's like to cross Putin and live to tell about it. As a Russian patriot and a former oligarch who's looked Vladimir Putin in the eye, Mikhail Khodorkovsky knows how the world looks to the Russian president. It's a pleasure to meet you. The day we meet is exactly 15 years since his arrest at gunpoint in Putin's Russia. Я в своей жизни 25 лет уже пытаюсь продвинуть свою страну в направлении нормальной европейской демократии. И вот вроде бы тебе кажется, что вот уже, вот мы уже почти там. Бах! Опять все обломалось. There does seem to be a pattern. Khodorkovsky was once Russia's richest man by buying cut-rate state oil assets in questionable auctions after the Soviet Union collapsed. But in a frank moment, he publicly crossed Putin on the rampant corruption under his rule. Overnight, he went from oligarch to accused of tax evasion and fraud. He spent 10 years in a Siberian prison camp until he was pardoned in 2013. He now lives in London, promoting democracy and calling out Putin at every opportunity. Ten years ago, I was что в тюрьме меня, скорее всего, что меня не будут убивать. Сегодня в сфере политического активизма, в сфере политического протеста вы можете быть даже убиты. 
That change, he says, happened gradually, culminating with a string of assassinations, up to and including the attempt on former Russian spy Sergei Skripal's life in the UK using nerve agent. After Russia annexed Crimea and destabilized East Ukraine, NATO countries, including Canada, sent soldiers to Baltic countries as a deterrent. I just wonder, what do you think of that strategy? Does it accomplish anything? Я считаю, что красная линия в виде солдат нейтральных государств является крайне важной. Да, эти мужчины и женщины рискуют своей жизнью, и они эту жизнь реально могут потерять. Но только их жизнь и их кровь является реальной красной линией. Donald Trump, meanwhile, has persistently cozied up to Putin. Their summit this week will be their second. Khodorkovsky says the first looked humiliating for Trump. What does it mean when the United States of America is retreating on the international stage? That can only be beneficial to Russia, no? Для Путина, как для предводителя кремлевского преступного сообщества, время действительно хорошее, потому что чем больше хаоса в мире, тем в этом хаосе больше возможностей для преступников. Легче они могут кого-то убивать из тех, кого они считают отступниками и так далее и тому подобное. В моем случае заказчиком может быть только Путин. There have been four attempts on Khodorkovsky's life, but he tells his followers not to worry. Друзья, не беспокойтесь. Sometimes he is tempted to give it all up. Мы ж черт бы с ними все забыли. Потом понимаешь, что ну, ты же не можешь, поднимаешь и идешь дальше. Путин, too, keeps going. Next month he celebrates 19 years in power. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. Up next on the National Family Reunions, right on the Canada-U.S. border, we bring you to the library that's become an unlikely gathering place in our moment. I was just hugging my parents. I was thinking, I wish I could uh, stop all clocks all over the world. First, though, we want to tell you about a new documentary from a guy I'll bet you know pretty well, Peter Mansbridge. It's called In Search of a Perfect World, and it explores the state of human rights and who's defending them. You can watch it Friday night on CBC Television right before the National. Here's a preview. One of the rights Hungarians are losing is to peacefully assemble. The Central European University is one of the best on the continent, drawing students from 120 countries. The government hates its liberal bent and is working to shut it down. Canadian Michael Ignatieff runs the school. If you folded up your tent and left, what would be the impact on the rest of civil society in Hungary? Oh, I don't think there's any question. There'd be tremendous discouragement, even despair. I think it'd be a, a devastating blow for freedom in this country. These single party states want to control everything. That's the drive, that's the driver. Uh, they want to control the courts, nobble the courts. They want to reduce the space for civil society. They want to, if possible, eliminate a free press. So they've got a single party regime that's steadily shrinking the space for freedom. That hug between two family members probably wouldn't be possible anywhere else on the planet. Separated by a travel ban, these people have come together at a library of all places, but not just any library. This one literally straddles the Canada-U.S. border. It even has two addresses, one for each country. And because of that, it's increasingly become a meeting spot for families who can't cross those borders. Their stories are our moment. 
So it's called the Haskell Free Library and Opera House, located on the border between Quebec and Vermont. It's become a sort of safe space for families denied entry into the U.S., but reunited here for just a moment at the century-old library. And they aren't the only ones who've made the pilgrimage to this place for no reason other than to see their families. This Iranian student traveled from Toronto to reunite with his sister. Even inside the library, there is a line that you can see this part is Canada, this part is uh, U.S. Another Iranian student, this time studying in the U.S., visited her family at the border on the same day. I was just hugging my parents. I can't explain how tough it was. Yeah, it's a remarkable phenomenon in a pretty interesting place, and it sort of harkens back to an era where, you know, you, you could cross the border and just sort of give a wave and a nod. Yeah, to no, well, and I remember, I mean, I was, I was living in Quebec for 10 years, and any time you'd go to the border, to Stansted in particular, you talk to folks who've lived there a long time, they, they remember exactly that, right? You could travel back and forth dozens of times a day. I mean, border, what border? And, and it, the library's easy. Uh, technically, the... Um, the address or the, the, the door is actually on the U.S. side. Right. So it requires a little bit of goodwill on the part of, of the border officials. And that's, that's where this is getting tricky. It's, that goodwill is not guaranteed anymore. Yeah, and I, mean, I guess that changed after September 11th, right? Uh, a long time ago. And, and so now there are signs posted saying, please don't do this, actually. Don't, don't hold family reunions there. But of course, this one was allowed, and they tend to be allowed uh, these days. That's The National for this November 28th. Have a good night. Good night.